Welcome to the Leadership School Podcast. I'm your host, leadership and self-care coach, Kyla Kofer. Here at the Leadership School, you'll hear leaders from around the world sharing their stories and expertise on how to lead with balance and integrity. Our goal? Teach you how to be an extraordinary leader. Welcome back, my friends. I'm Kyla Kofer, and I'm here with my friend, Manya Chalinski. So Manya is a survivor of the Boston Marathon bombing, and she uses her experience to now teach and train other people on what it means to be trauma sensitive. So I know we've talked about this before, but we're going to really get today into some practical how-tos, some principles of trauma sensitivity, and what to do if you're the leader who's been through a traumatic experience. How do you approach that? So thank you so much for joining me and listening. I'm grateful and honored to share this space with you. Here we are with my friend, Manya. Manya, thank you for joining me on Leadership School. We have been talking about this for a really long time, so I'm glad that I could finally have you on and hear what you have to say. So before we really get into it, why don't you introduce yourself for everybody listening? Oh, thank you, Kyla. I'm so excited to be here. I love talking with you, as you know. My name is Manya Chalinski, and I help leaders understand how to deal with people who've gone through difficult life experiences. And that takes the form of giving talks and sometimes workshops and sometimes consulting, where I talk about the importance of the words that you choose in helping people heal in talking about what is trauma sensitive leadership and How is that something we can incorporate into our organization? And I also talk about resiliency, even though that is a word that I hate. (laughs) (laughs) What makes you hate the word resiliency? I think a little bit is how it came into my life. I certainly knew the word, but in terms of psychological resiliency, emotional resiliency, the first time I heard that was after experiencing mass violence. And I'm a survivor of the Boston Marathon bombing, and I was at a meeting of survivors where they were talking about resiliency. And I remember thinking, I don't have that. I don't know what they're talking about. That's not something I have. Who are these lucky people who have this thing called resiliency? So it started out already a little fraught. And the more I pay attention to resiliency, the more I fear that when we're talking about it in the public sphere, we're talking about it as a way to say to people, hey, you're resilient. And then by the way, that means I don't have to take care of you. I don't have to be trauma sensitive in the way that I deal with you. So yeah, I have a slightly less hate relationship with the word. I love this. We're diving right in. I have more questions about your story and about why you're here and all that. But I love this diving straight into this because we've talked about resiliency on this podcast before, and this is a unique perspective. So what I'm hearing from you is that it's not so much the word, but it's the context of the word and it's the ownership with the word that in using it, people are saying that I don't have to have any ownership over this situation or being there for this person because they've got it. They're resilient. Yes. I love you framing it that way as not having to take ownership. Okay. Well, that makes sense. I see why you would be hesitant against that word because we do all have to take ownership of our only ourselves. But when we're leading the way from other people, we are taking ownership of and some responsibility of the people who are leading. I mean, yes, everybody owns themselves, but there's still responsibility there. Right. We all live in the world and we work in a workplace with other people and systems and procedures and processes. And if the things around us are not supportive, then does it matter how resilient I am? I mean, yes, it does. But if I'm then not getting support for the things that I need help with, my resiliency isn't the only thing that's going to impact whether or not I'm able to recover or I'm healthy. Oh, yeah. That's going to be really important. Well, that that gets us right into why we're here. So we're talking about trauma-sensitive leadership today. And a couple episodes back, we talked with David Dottie, which you actually know David, and I've talked with him about trauma-informed leadership. And I'm bringing you here because I think you bring a totally different perspective, and both of them are really, really valuable. So I really believe this is an important conversation. But maybe you can explain to us the difference between David's trauma-informed leadership and trauma-sensitive leadership and why we need to talk about them both. Yes. The difference is probably not as great as you might imagine. It might entirely just be the word. Instead of saying trauma-informed, I started saying trauma-sensitive. I think because I'm not necessarily, I do sometimes work in the healthcare, you know, work with companies in the healthcare field, but I think, you know, the word trauma is scary. 
and saying trauma informed, that feels like a very medical term. That feels like a very official psychological term, which it actually is. So in my case, I wanted to make it maybe a little less heavy handed for the folks that I'm talking to, but the core is the same, which is finding a way to make sure that we're dealing with people who are dealing with trauma in their lives and that we are not re-traumatizing them, that we're creating an environment where they are. You know, I just gave a talk on this topic on trauma-sensitive leadership, and I made sure to say, you know, this is not talking about we all should sit around and share our feelings together. It's not about that. It's about creating an environment where people feel safe and welcome and seen. And so I think I started calling it trauma-sensitive leadership because I wanted to maybe take the edge off, but a lot of the principles are the same. Making people feel safe and seen. You know, I guess that's really what we talk about a lot. I think all last season in this podcast, we talked about people first leadership and and what that is and how that mattered. And I of the belief that to be a positive and effective and great leader, that's what you're doing. That's part of the definition is that you're making people feel seen and part of a story. So one thing that stuck out to me and then something else that that we want to make sure we're not re-traumatizing people, which if we're not in a psychiatrist or psychologist, and even those people can't be perfect. We don't live in a vacuum. So that can be something that we're not aware of. We don't know how to do. So I want to talk about that, what that looks like. But also I just want to bring up because I'm thinking about it. We want to be careful to not exploit people and their traumas, which I think can be really easy to do. Well, this person was a survivor like you of the Boston Marathon bombing. And so now we're going to like exploit that in you to try and for our own gain. And I think that that We need to be sensitive about that as well. So maybe you can talk a little about both of those things. Well, actually, there's a great example going on right now, depending on which news media outlets you're listening to. You know, there was recently a just horrific shooting in Texas, and some of those parents are testifying in Congress at a point in their lives when this is not what they need to be doing, putting themselves on the public stage, putting everything out there in an effort to make change, to affect real change. And having somebody tell their story in this kind of environment is absolutely re-traumatizing. These folks haven't even had a chance to process the original, the trauma that they're still dealing with. I know that there are survivors, just to stick on that theme, I know there are survivors of previous shootings who get asked to share their story and get asked to talk about it in incredible detail or show photos, things that we were kind of trying to get them to prove that they were hurt enough or that their pain is enough that then we will do what it is they want us to do. Those kinds of things, those are unique examples, but those kinds of things are incredibly re-traumatizing. Just to satisfy our own curiosity, tell me all the details. What exactly happened? How did you feel? How many times? And walk me through it all. We just have this great need for curiosity and details. I wonder how much of it is that we want to feel that kind of trauma with somebody. Like, I mean, that's kind of a twisted thing, but I think there's some part of us that like, we don't understand it. So in order to empathize, we feel like we need all the details, but we don't need all the details. We can still have empathy without having all of that information. And just because we're curious doesn't mean we need to know. Right. I find it fascinating. I'm part of a group of survivors of terrorist attacks and we all get it. I don't, I can meet somebody for the first time and understand what they're going through, even though their experience is different, the level of physical injury, often completely different than what I experienced. But we all get it. And we don't have to explain that piece of us. And then outside of that environment, it's very difficult for people to understand, which makes sense. I certainly didn't understand this experience before going through it myself nine years ago. And I think there is a curiosity and just speaking for myself, I have gotten to the point now where I can tell if somebody is asking me a question because they're curious about my own well-being or my health and how am I taking care of myself? Or if they're asking a question because they're curious, I've never been in a bombing. What was that like? And then the third people who kind of have an agenda or 
are trying to get me to say something and maybe not as open and friendly as an objective as some others. And I can now tell just by the way you ask the question, almost with the exact same words, I can tell kind of where you're landing on that. And then if I should even answer the question, people still do probe in a way beyond just the curiosity of I'm a human. And what was that like? I appreciate that kind of curiosity. Wow. So I'm curious then during the aftermath of your experience, what were some people who approached that well with you and people that who didn't not like asking you to name those people, but I'm just saying, what are some ways in that was approached well with you and some ways that weren't? And then now, how are you taking that? And you're teaching people about trauma sensitive leadership. So let's pull all of this kind of together. I'm trying to think of, you know, I guess those are two different directions of my questions, but I really am just wondering how that played out for you. Yes. That's a great question. And who did it well and who didn't do it well are two sides of the coin. And the people who didn't do it well, to a certain extent, I have to say thank you to them because I wouldn't be here talking about this subject, trying to educate people on being trauma sensitive if I hadn't bumped up against a lot of people who weren't being trauma sensitive. So to start with the positive, the folks who really were helpful were people who were able to let me be in pain, who were able to let me be vulnerable, and who were willing to admit that they didn't necessarily know how to help me. That sounds like kind of going through someone who's grieving anything. Yes, it's not that different from how to deal with someone who's lost a loved one. And people who let me lead the way, saying, yes, I want to do this. No, I don't want to do this. Especially early on. One of the things about trauma, which does not have to be for your listeners, does not have to be a big trauma, like a bomb literally going off in someone's life, but it can take away your sense of control. And so one of the gifts people can give you afterwards is giving you back a little bit of that control. So you may think that I should be in therapy, but if I don't think that, then you need to kind of follow my lead and don't insist that I go to therapy or make an appointment without asking me. But instead, if I decide I want to go to therapy, then offer to drive me. But if I decide I don't want to go to therapy, then that's what I have chosen for myself, whether or not it's what you would have chosen for me. And so I dealt with many people in my life, family and friends who were just really able to let me feel what I needed to feel and were afraid of being uncomfortable around me. Sometimes that's it, right? Is someone comes in to the office after you know something really bad has just happened to them. And you're like, uh, uh, what do I say? I don't want to make it worse. Do I make a joke? Is that okay? Like, do I ask them about it directly? Do I avoid the subject entirely? I mean, people who care, you're asking yourself a lot of these questions because you want to make the best effort and you're not going to make some joke about it like in an improper way. You know, you're going to think through that. I mean, how do you get through that awkward moment. Do you just let it be awkward and get through it? Because I kind of think you do, but yeah, you know, I think you just let it be awkward. And you know, that's, (laughs) that isn't a great answer, right? But the truth is, you know, there's a couple things happening. If you have ever grieved someone you love, you may remember this time. This is very similar. There were times when I had no idea what was going on around me. So you could have said anything and I wouldn't have noticed. There were times when I didn't know how to help myself. I'd never gone through something like this before. And I had no idea what the right step, the right quote unquote steps were to take to recover. And I'll be honest with you. Some people did say the wrong thing. People in my life said the wrong things. And some of those people are no longer in my life. I made the choice to not continue to be around people who couldn't accept that I was traumatized and that I was dealing with this. So yeah, it is uncomfortable. I'd say you're right. Jokes are definitely not the way to start out. But I think, you know, you said the word, we both said the word earlier, curiosity. I think, you know, being open, being vulnerable. And if you are those things, your curiosity is going to be okay. If you ask me if I want to talk about it and I say no, and you respect that. And that's the other thing is really listening to what the person who's dealing with it wants to do. Some people 
get a lot of value out of sharing their story, talking about it with certain people, with everybody, who knows? A lot of people don't get any value with sharing their stories. They're much more private for whatever reasons. And that's fine if they don't want to share what's going on or their deepest feelings about what's happening. So as the person who's dealing with them, it's just kind of being able to be flexible and be open and listen to what they are saying and what they're telling you they need. And also to recognize that, especially if you're dealing with someone who has experienced a significant trauma recently, their emotions are going to be all over the place and sometimes really intense. So that also can be really uncomfortable to sit with somebody who's feeling really intense emotions. But do it anyways. Yeah. If you can. Yeah. If you can. Yeah. And also remember, I think we sometimes forget this, but I don't have to be the person who talks to you after something bad happens to you. If you have somebody, that's great. Maybe I don't need to be that person. I personally now, I can be that person for certain people in my life and for certain kinds of things in my life. But for people I don't know very well, I can't be that person for something intense that's happening to them. And I just have to see if I can help them find somebody who can be. Hey, one of my goals here at the Leadership School podcast is really to provide you with a lot of resources that can really enhance your leadership. And one resource that I found recently is the Humanitarian Entrepreneur Podcast. So I wanted to refer you to go check them out. What the Humanitarian Entrepreneur is doing is they're talking about what does it look like to do good in the world, but not exhaust yourself and burn yourself out and not be completely broke. You know, can you invest in yourself? Can you be an entrepreneur, but also change the world? And how do you do that well? So go check it out. Let us know what you think. I think it's a really great resource and really believe that you're going to benefit from it. So I'm kind of thinking like, let's say we're in a leadership role, like in an office. Maybe you run a nonprofit and you've got your team and your team members, one of your team members just went through something and they show up at work on Monday. I would probably approach and say, hey, I'm just checking in with you. How are you doing? What kind of support do you need from me? Or what kind of support can I offer you? And then I would, uh, my thought would be to let the other person definitely respond and also just say, hey, if you would like to chat about it, I'm here. We can chat. But if you don't, I'll just go about my business and that's fine too. Would one of those work for you? That's exactly. You did mention what can I do to support you? Just recognizing that people aren't necessarily going to know the answer to that question. So that is hard for me personally because I want to support people. And so I would naturally want to just do something because in my mind, I hear people do need the support, but they don't know what they need. So there's, if I can offer something, they can say yes or no to it. Yes. So I might say, would it be helpful if I brought you a meal? Would you appreciate that? And I mean, I did that this week. I had a friend who went through something and they said, no, we don't want that. And I said, okay, that's fine. You know, whatever. And then, but I offered something else. Would it be helpful if I watched your kids? And she said, yes. And so we watched their kids and that was really helpful. But yeah, I think sometimes we just don't know what we need at all. So that those things happen to you. Was that helpful when people offer those kinds of things? It absolutely or was it annoying. Was, it was help. No, it was helpful when people offered specific things because I did not have the ability to think strategically or think deeply or even really understand what was happening to me. So I didn't know what was happening. I definitely didn't know what I needed to do to make it better. But if you said, can I bring you a meal? The answer is easy. Yes or no. I want that. I don't want that. Can I come visit you? Yes or no. It's simple. I want it. I don't want it. All I have to say. And okay, I'll check back with you in a couple of days. Great. Perfect. Is it helpful to ask people really directly to say, how do you want me to go about interacting with you right now? (laughs) Like if you're in an office and you've got a lot of stuff going on, is it helpful to say like, would you like me to keep checking in with you? Or would you like me to just pretend, just go on and get work done? Like, or do you want me to find a a place in between? Like, how do you want to interact here or just kind of figure it out? Well, that's a really good question. And of course, because we're all so individual. It's different for each of us. In my own experience, I can say that it it was most helpful when people offered me something reasonably specific. Like, 
I'm going to go get dinner. Can I pick something up for you? Because that's, I know the answer. I'll check in with you in a couple of days. Great. But if you asked me a question that required me to think of sure. what, to possibly, what could I do to help you? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. There's a million things I need. What is the thing that I want you to help me with? I don't know. So, you know, when you're talking about the work environment, you're also talking about people who don't necessarily have the same emotional connection as my best friend and I do, as my parents and I do, or as my good friend who's my neighbor and I do. So I think it can feel harder to want to even tread into the fact that someone's dealing with some difficult emotions. And we have taught, you led this off with, you know, say something happened to someone over the weekend and you happen to know that. But a lot of times people are dealing with these kinds of stressors or dealing with a certain level of trauma. And we don't actually know what has happened, or we don't know that something happened recently. It could be a childhood trauma, but it's something that's still a problem for them. So you know, I like to think about these trauma sensitive principles as things that we just bring to each other, no matter what we know about what's happened to somebody. Kind of, I heard it said the other day, like building a big tent, building the big tent and having everybody inside rather than people who are outside trying to get in. And right now, sometimes in some organizations, the people who are dealing with trauma are the people who are on the outside of the tent trying to come in and be part of it, but they don't feel safe or they don't feel comfortable. When you've experienced something, whether it's like you said, recent or childhood, sometimes childhood things come back up. Like if you're going through therapy or you saw somebody and again, and you're remembering all of those things, you know, or a situation happened and it just all came rushing back. I'll jump in with, according to the CDC, 60% of men and 50% of women had gone through at least one trauma in their life. So you can kind of assume that if you're in a room with more than two people, somebody in that room has probably dealt with some sort of trauma. Now it may be long past and they may be healed from it completely, but these are the kinds of things about each other that we can't really know. Well, and we don't need to, like, I don't need right. you in order to hire you. You need to first come through and tell me all of your experiences in life. And what are we actually dealing with here? Like, no, can you do the job? And what kind of support do you need to do that? Right. And that's why I continue on this metaphor, building this trauma sensitive tent that takes care of everybody and doesn't ask you, doesn't require that you disclose your trauma in order to get some support or to be part of an employee resource group or to get a particular benefit because they're available to everybody. And you don't have to tell somebody your story and say, please, please help me. That support and assistance is available because anybody could need it at any time. Yeah. And I think when we're talking about working in a group full of people, that comes down to basic human dignity and respect. Like I can respect that you have a story in your life and that I have one too, and that we're going to be supportive of each other in our own stories and supportive towards this ultimate goal that we all have that we're working towards together. And, you know, when you're doing that as a leader, you're, you're bringing people along into a story. And so everybody comes with their own perspectives into that story, but they're all working on the same story. And so it's how can I support you best to be a part of this particular story? That doesn't mean I have to know all the details of your trauma. I don't have to know all your histories. But if you want to share them, we can go there. But boundaries are going to really come into play there because we also have to decide how much am I willing to enter that person's story and how much is appropriate to enter another person's story. Sometimes it's not really appropriate to do that and, and you don't need to. And there's some boundaries that can get really crossed there. How do you set some boundaries with the people that you're interacting with? I want to take a step back, actually. I mean, that's the point of creating an organization or a system that is trauma sensitive at its core, that is a place where people feel safe. There's transparency and trust between, um, you know, leadership and everybody else. There's a level of support with your peers and people feel empowered. And there's a level of equity and cultural affirmation, because you don't want to make it, you don't want to have an environment where somebody has to disclose. You want it to be that the environment is taking care of everybody, 
whatever their trauma may be, and that you do not require that they share necessarily the details of what's going on. Maybe you need to explain why you need to take paid time off or you need to take a sabbatical or, but you, you shouldn't have to prove that you are a victim or prove that you are traumatized. So that's why kind of taking these principles and creating an environment that has compassion and empathy for everybody makes it so that you don't have to cross those boundaries. Because in my own experience and few survivors that I know, a lot of recovery is about setting boundaries, especially if you are in any way public about it. It's having to say, these are the things I will talk about. These are the things I won't talk about. And whether that's you're actually saying it or they're just in your own head, you know what your line is. Again, because of that curiosity and because, you know, some people do find other people's trauma I'm going to use the word entertaining. It you is. You do like, have to can create like, boundaries. You need more drug. I mean, I felt like this at times, you know, when like I'm on the interstate and I see a wreck and you're like turning your neck to try and see what's happened. You've got this, we just have this curiosity in us and interest in things. And I think sometimes the need to be the hero, we want to feel like we know the right things to say or how to respond and do in the moment. But you have mentioned some principles and I think you've mentioned several of them, but maybe you can walk us through like, just the list of what are some of those principles of being trauma sensitive in your leadership? Sure. So number one is in fact, building a sense of safety, free from bullying and harassment, for example, physical safety in the environment, emotional safety, transparency and trust. And this is really key, involving people in conversations that involve them. So if you're making a decision about a particular person or a particular group of people to include them in the conversation. And also using Which strength. feels simple, but it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It happens less often than you would think. <laughs> oh, we can probably do a quick roundup of some governmental decisions and know that pretty quickly. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. And helping people who choose to do so using their lived experience to promote recovery and healing, maybe being peer support within an organization. And remembering that not everyone with a lived experience wants to share and empowering people. For me, that means using strengths based language. So assuming that people are resilient, there's that word again, and that they will recover from something that's happened to them. They will get better and offer them support, but talk about it in a way that you know they're going to be okay. And I like to say their voice, their choice. Let them, in as much as possible, choose what they talk about and how they're involved. And then, again, equity and cultural affirmation. So for organizations, that can mean acknowledging your biases and power differentials, how those can impact people in the organization, and building a safe space for open and honest conversations, and also having policies that are truly responsive to the racial, ethnic, and cultural needs of the people in your organization or the people that you are serving. And that's a whole other avenue of we could go down. But, you know, those are the basic principles of how to create this organization that, you know, is that big tent that takes care of everybody, even though everybody doesn't always need everything. I would say it's almost neglectful to be a leader of an organization, a company, no matter what size, that to not think about some of these things. If you are a leader and you're not thinking about trauma sensitivity and some of these principles, then you have neglected a key part of your job description. <laughs> uh, because like you said, so many people do come in with traumas and everybody's trauma is different. And just because your trauma might be bigger than mine doesn't make it bigger or less effective of my life. You know, it doesn't make it like less impactful in my life because I did not experience the same type of trauma that you did. Right. And I'm sure that you and your listeners know some of the statistics about when people are dealing with mental health issues and stress in the workplace, in the additional money that it costs the organization for their health care, the amount of money lost for absenteeism and the turnover costs. So, you know, these are all 
really heavily dotted lines between the trauma and this bottom line. But I think it can be hard to show, it can be hard to take that large policy and draw a direct line to, well, if we don't have open communications, it means we're losing this much per year. I think it can be a little bit difficult to make those connections, but there are so many studies that talk about the cost of presenteeism, the cost of absenteeism, the cost of people dealing with mental health issues. And because when we're talking about trauma, we're talking about so many people and so many different kinds of things that can happen in their lives, making a change to the way your organization thinks about taking care of people, I think could make a real difference for the bottom line. Yeah, because it's almost like we could approach of, well, I think that person over there has a trauma or a disability. You know, we, we've talked about accessibility a lot here too. Is we have to make way for that person over there. And that really doesn't serve anybody well because it doesn't bring them as part of your culture and community. And it's not creating a safe, open space for somebody else to go, well, yeah, I've got some things too in my life. And it makes it seem, it really stigmatizes it. It makes it be like, well, there's something different about you. So we're going to put you over here in this category. I'm using my hands to really push somebody over. You're putting you in this category and there's something different about you. So you just need a little extra help, dear. No, you know, like that doesn't really help anybody. And really to acknowledge that everybody has something in their life that's been hard. That's part of the human experience. Everybody's got something. And so the more we can provide resources for everybody, and provide those safe spaces for everybody, just the more successful we'll be as a culture in society overall. Right. People are messy. Our lives are messy. When you really, if you ever dig into somebody's life, right? There's just, they're just messy. I talk about my experience. So you happen to know one of the things that has happened in my life, right? right? For other people, it's not necessarily something that big or it is absolutely that big, but they don't want to talk about it. But you know what? Think about how much time we spend at work. If you imagine somebody works an eight hour work day and they sleep eight hours, I don't know who those people are. I'd love to be them. But if you think about that one day, half of your waking life is spent in your work environment. So it's going to have a real impact on your health and well being, no matter what's going on with you, whether you've had a trauma or not. And If we can create these workplaces that understand that we're all messy, but we can still get our work done if we're just supported. I want to go back to what we talked about earlier about re-traumatizing real quick before we kind of head towards the end of our conversation here. But as we're, we're approaching that, we're thinking about all of these things. How do we caution with re-traumatizing people? We've talked about this a little bit, but I want to get like really clear on it because re-traumatizing is going to be like that, making you tell the story again over and over, bringing it up, bringing up different things and, you know, making that the pinpoint of your life. Like your life is only about this one thing that's happened to you or this one thing that you did. How do we be sensitive about that? And to admit when we've maybe screwed up, like, oh, I did not realize what I was doing. And I'm really sorry. Like, let's approach this again, but let's be people who someone can say that to us. Someone can approach us and tell us that and that we're not going to fly off the handle. What do you mean? I, I, I wasn't re-traumatizing you. you know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and also because I, as a survivor, again, just taking my own story, I'm not going to say, stop doing that. You are re-traumatizing me because I don't necessarily know that that's what's happening. But for me, the avoiding re-traumatization is all about control because trauma takes away your sense of control. It takes away your sense of safety. And it's really important to let people, you know, their voice, their choice can control their own story and include them in conversations about them. Not doing those things are things that can be quite re-traumatizing for people. Asking somebody to share their story, knowing full well that you are not going to make any changes whatsoever based on what they share with you. Just asking them for the sake of a story time. Just asking for the sake or for theater to make it look like you're going to be doing something. And yes, we listen to everybody. We're still not going to change the policy, but we listen to everybody. So that's good. So to me, the basis of it is really control. And if you mess up, because we all do, we're all human. We all say the wrong thing sometime with the best of intentions. Then it's just about owning it and apologizing. 
because I also mentioned earlier on trust and transparency. So I, as a worker, I, as a human need to be able to trust somebody that I'm working with. I need to trust that you will listen to me. I need to trust that you are not going to share my story without my permission. I need to trust that if you say you were going to do something, that's what you're going to do. And by taking away someone's control, we're you telling me this is now how something's going to be, or the only way I can get services is if I share with you my trauma. I'm not going to trust you. Yeah. I love how this all boils down to like boundaries and compassion and, and respect. Ownership. Yeah. We, what we've talked about boundaries, ownership, respect, dignity, some of these basic principles, trust. Yeah. You know, things, the things we learned in kindergarten, but you know, work environments can feel so different because you've got the profit motive and which is not necessarily a bad thing, but you're all together for this shared purpose. And the shared purpose is fulfilling the mission of the organization, whether that's creating widgets or saving the world, but you are brought together with people who you might not otherwise (laughs) spend time with. And you've, you're part of this community. And I think it's often been thought of as just kind of a separate entity from the rest of life, but it's not. It's so ingrained for so many of us. We spend so much time at work. What if we flip the script a little bit and talk about when you're the leader and you've experienced some trauma, how do you go about continuing to lead people while you're also going through a traumatic experience. And it might be just one we just think about too, but. You know, I'm going to quote that old trope. We've all heard it. You have to put your own oxygen mask on first before you can help others. And, you know, it's true. And the best thing I think that as a leader you can do, if you are going through something, is to take care of yourself. And that may mean stepping away or handing over the reins for a short amount of time so somebody else can deal with it, with the day-to-day of the work environment. Because, you know, there are circumstances, if you think about workplace violence, where everybody in the workplace experienced it. So now the leader has experienced it, and so have the employees and the staff. So that's something you're all going through together. But as the leader, people are going to be looking to you. It may be something that you've gone through alone, not something work-related. I think it's all about self-care. And for some people, that's compartmentalizing things and dealing with work at work and other stuff at home. For some people, they can't. I'm in certain times, I'm absolutely not good at compartmentalizing and other times I'm I'm quite good at it. But all of those self-care things that we know are really important if you're the leader who's dealing with a trauma. Hey, thanks so much for listening. Since you've listened this far, it tells me you're really enjoying the content. And I'm so, so grateful. I work really hard to bring you some awesome resources to help really enhance your leadership game. If you're liking this, can you pause really quickly? Make sure you're subscribed, but then also share with one person or more people who you think could really benefit from the content. My goal is to really bring this into some of the top podcasts on leadership in the world, and you can help get there and help us grow by sharing this with everyone you know. Thank you so much. I'm glad you're enjoying the episode. I think it's important too to note that you don't, just because you're the person in leadership doesn't mean you have to have all the answers. That there's this great lie out here that says that everybody else knows what they're doing, but it's not true. Like nobody really knows what they're doing. We're all just figuring this out. And if you're leading the way and kind of going through some of these experiences yourself, it's okay to say, I don't have the answers right now and to start looking for other resources. And that's what the leader's job is, is to find those resources to bring people along and to offer that support and to ask for the support when you need it to show by example, to show I need some support here. I need some help, but to be the one to find those resources and and to take the action. Really, you're the one stepping up and saying, I'm going to take the action. I'm going to move us forward here. But it's important, not just that it's okay, but it's important and it's crucial, required, that you also are taking care of yourself. Right. If you think about an organization where you want to show everybody that 
You are a trauma sensitive environment. You are taking care of everybody. You don't have to ask for special treatment. As a leader going through something difficult, it's not that it's all about work and being a leader, but that's an opportunity to model that kind of behavior as well. And you know, it all comes back to, I think, a word that you mentioned a little bit earlier, which is stigma. Because what we're talking about is people's mental and emotional health. And that still is difficult for some people to talk about. It's still difficult for people to think of that as part of the body, part of, yeah, part of something that needs attention. Yeah. I think the very thin, thin silver lining to the pandemic shaped cloud that we're all living through is that people are talking more about mental health and in general and in the workplace and people are doing more studies and people are really looking at how can I support my employees mental health. So I like to think, I hope my fingers and toes are crossed that we're chipping away at stigma now that more people are thinking about it. But we don't like to share our mental health. Some people never share, talk about those kind of things, our emotions. And in a workplace in particular, it can feel really fraught to even have emotions, depending on your type of workplace. So, you know, I don't think anybody has a problem with if I break my leg and I still need to come to work. Okay, quick, let's accommodate. Let's fix things. We'll change her desk so she can use the wheelchair. We'll fix this. We'll do that. Nobody seems to question those kind of changes or adaptations. But as soon as it gets to mental health, there's a like, whoa, this is different. You know, the cool thing is, is I think you mentioned this, but I really have seen a shift in our culture. It's slow. I mean, if you just think about 50 years ago, these conversations weren't really happening at all. Maybe in a therapy, like a someone who was interested in psychology, who was writing the book on it, you know, maybe not 50 years ago, maybe 60, maybe we have to go back even further. <laughs> I forget my age. Sometimes I, sometimes I still, still think 2000 was just a few years ago. <laughs> but you know, way back, you know, people really weren't having these conversations. And if they were, there was really something wrong with you. And oh, that person need, you know, there's something different about that person or they just weren't enough. They couldn't figure it out and they had problems. But as it got more and more common, people are starting to realize slowly, it's like we're slowly waking up and realizing that, wait a second, that's really not true. It never, it never has been true. And it's not true now. It wasn't true then that there's something wrong with you if you have a mental health issue any more than there's something wrong with you if you have cancer or a broken leg or whatever. It's just what your experience is. And there are resources and support for that. And so if we're going to find resources and support for your cancer or for your broken leg, we should get resources and support for your mental health as well. And and I've seen, I have a lot of joy, I think, for me, I'm seeing a, this huge shift in it. Every day I'm on social media and I just see people talking about it. And the more we're vulnerable with our own experiences, the more we offer other people the opportunity to be vulnerable with theirs. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think I just want it to be moving faster. Um, I, don't we all? <laughs> but I agree with you. I've definitely seen some changes. And even from you know my own young adulthood, thinking about the way we think and talk about these things, I have just gotten to a point in my life where I'm like, all right, I see the light. Let's everybody get there. <laughs> right, right. Well, that's why we have these conversations too, is just to say... We're bringing others into that light with us and to go, this is not a weird thing to talk about. This is a normal thing to talk about, especially if you've got 60% of people, like you said earlier, who have experienced some kind of traumatizing event. And at some point in your life, you probably will. Everybody has something in them. And I would even venture to say, if you're reading the news, if you're involved in social media on a consistent, regular basis, then you are experiencing some trauma anyways. Maybe you might not be in the middle of it, but by continuing to put yourself in those situations and you got the bad news bias and reading all that information, that can be really, really tough for some people. And if people don't have a support system and places to talk about that and have healthy support, then they're coming to work for that. They might be a single person who lives in a house by themselves and doesn't have a community and their community is coming to work. And that's the place that they need to come to find support. But that's not even at work. Like this is at your church or your synagogue or your neighborhood barbecue. This is in your family reunions, the places where people are coming and there's 
differences of opinions and you, any place you have people gathering, you've got things like this happening. What a great opportunity that we have as leaders to be the ones who, to say, I'm here for you. I support you. I'm not going to tell you that I'm a safe person because then you'll immediately think I'm not, but to create, <laughs> create a spirit about me where you know that I'm a safe person that you can talk to me about, or, Hey, can I bring you some cookies? Because this has been a hard week for you. And I just made some cookies, you know, to show up to be the person who shows up and to care enough to show up. That's what leadership is. Yeah, absolutely. So. I cannot improve on that. <laughs> I would love to hear, Vanya. We talk about balance. and We've already talked about that. You've even mentioned my magic word, self-care. So for you personally, what does it look like for you to have a balanced life with your work and your speaking and your own processing of your own trauma and all that? What does balance mean to you and look like? I love that question. I was just talking about this with a friend. I have finally come to the conclusion that balance for me does not mean equilibrium. Balance for me means like I'm on a teeter-totter and my goal is just never to be all the way at the top or all the way at the bottom. But I will have, you know, weeks where I am flat out with everything I've got to do. And then suddenly everything frees up and I've got a few days where it's a lighter workload, and lighter social load. And I think to myself, I do this all the time. I think to myself, I have anything to do. But if I just look back or look forward to the plans for the next week. So for me, what I realized is kind of learning the pace of my life and you know, either being okay with it, which I realize I am, or changing it when I need to. I take a lot of personal time for myself. I have days of the week or evenings that I will block off and my plans are spending time with me, not social, would even Zoom, going out, any of that. I definitely do tend to focus more on work than on leisure activities. So it's kind of reminding myself to take those breaks when I need to, but I do a lot of self-care. I meditate, I do yoga. I love to go for long walks. Chris Kelso, I talked to him just recently and his answer was, it's like being on a bike where you're balancing and you use a teeter totter. And so that maybe that kind of made me laugh a little bit, but I really appreciate that you take that time, but that you brought up that important topic of sometimes it's easier to do work than leisure. And so I wonder what it is that we put so much value on. And you're, I'm not asking you to answer this. I'm just wondering out loud. We put that value on work as being something that we have to do and that we need to do and these checklists and these priorities, but we don't really think about that as our leisure. And so I'm trying to teach myself to like flip that. Like the leisure time is just as important and takes needs as much effort and much of my attention as my work time. And that, that looks like balance. Well, what about integrity? We actually haven't talked about that a lot in this episode, but I'm just curious, what does it mean to you to live with integrity? We haven't used the word very much in this episode, but I think we've been talking about integrity. To me, it's honesty and follow through, right? It's being honest and open with who you are and doing what you say you're going to do. And that is something that builds trust, right? Both of those things are something that builds trust with other people. I have a whole string of people in my email inbox who have not gotten back to me. And by all rights, need to get back to me, but they don't. So then I start to question, you know, do I trust this person? Do they have integrity? They can't even respond to me when something, when they have said they are going to respond to me. So what does that mean about doing business with this particular person? So yeah, that's how I think of it. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for that. Hey, how can we get in touch with you? You know, if we're looking for more information on being trauma sensitive, or we're looking to help our leadership and grow in that, how can my listeners find you? You can come to my website, which is manyachilinski.com, which I'm hoping we put in the show notes to spell it right for everybody. And my email is manya at manyachilinski.com. And on social media, I live on Twitter and LinkedIn. So those are places where I share some of my thoughts and also ways to get in touch with me. 
Awesome. Thank you. Well, is there anything else you would like to say before we go? Make sure I don't want you to walk away having left something unsaid. I have not left anything unsaid. You had great questions and I got to all the points that I wanted to make. So I guess my final thought is thank you for this conversation and for your leadership in thinking about how we can be trauma sensitive in our work lives and our personal lives. Well, thank you so much for coming and joining me in the conversation. It's been really valuable to me really, as I think I'm a really practical person. So I want to think through like practical and we talked about some of that. Okay. What specifically can we do? Because I think we need that when we're talking about these issues. And when we talk in these generalized terms, it's just like, okay, that's all well and good, but what do I do? <laughs> and so right. I, think, I think this conversation really helped with that. And I'm, I'm just really grateful for you being willing to share your story and being the person to put these out in the open and say, hey, let's talk about it. And so thank you so much for joining me and for being my friend and coming along. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining me on this journey to grow in our leadership. If you enjoyed this episode, you've got to check out the leadership and self-care coaching programs on my website at kylacofer.com. Let's change the world together.